And welcome, Ooh. ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, cr creator of creator of tape two of uh, of of the of the um cyber rock comic Arith. I am pre I'm pretty sure I mispronounced that. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine, man. And the and a and a and a man who is essentially a one a one man army when it comes when it comes to his pro his this particular affair, and to quote and to quote the Indiegogo, I'm a dude playing a dude pretending to be another dude. <laughs> Finally, someone gets where that quote was from. What? Nope. What? None of the, none of the people you've talked about have, have seen Tropic Thunder. Nope. No one, no, no one's picked that up yet. Nope. Shame them. Yeah. The one, the one and only Brian Butvitas. How you doing tonight, man? Pretty good, man. How are you? I'm doing good. It's I had to um, it looks it looks like it's gonna storm tonight, so I I had to make sh I had to make sure to close to close up all the windows. At least on the plus side, I won't have to water the plants tonight. That's true. That's true. I just have I just have to deal with with my with my plants possibly getting robbed by rabbits again. Well, that's no bueno. Yeah, I ha I got a bunch of vegetables out in the ba out in the back and um. I'd like I'd like to use them to make to make salads, but some but sometimes the rabbits get to get to my stuff before I can. Yeah, we have to deal with javelinas. They do that here. They eat up like all the vegetation. Mm -hmm. So it's they're not as cute as rabbits, but yeah, they, they'll tear everything up. Um, I had th I had thought of I had thought about just I had thought about sometimes just sitting back just sitting back there with a shotgun and when some when somebody <laughs> come, when somebody comes up and asks they go shh. Be very, very quiet. I'm hunting rabbits. Yeah, can't shoot javelinas with a shotgun and do absolutely nothing to them. Unfortunately, <laughs> I've no, seen one of those things get hit by a, by a car doing sixty on the freeway, and the thing just kept walking like nothing happened. So, I mean, the worst that but the worst that I have to the worst I have to deal with isn't rabbits. It's either geese or turkeys. Oh, geese are bastards. They're they're evil little bastards. Oh yeah. They are, they are assholes. But um, getting back to saner matters that don't in, that don't involve me stepping in goose shit. Um, I like to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. So, how, walk me through how you how you first got into um, comics. Um, you know, comics was never a major. And people laugh at this because you know I'm a I'm a comic creator, um, but I'm more I call myself more of a product developer. Uh, I'm not really in a comic. I'm creating a product because we're doing more than the comic. But I've been writing for a very very long time. I started writing uh, around second or third grade. I used to write these stories to kind of uh, deal with crap and trauma that you know, that I was dealing with as as, as a young kid. And I always kept the notes of that of those these little stories I wrote all the way up through college. I was writing these little stories, and one day I digitized them, put them all put them all in a Google Doc, and kind of just left them there and let them set. I, I published actually a couple of books. One book was really big back in 2010. I was a, a part of a very large social experiment, uh, launching a satire site. During the uh, Obama, the first Obama elections, and we were doing some social experimenting, and created this massive social satire website that turned into a large publishing deal. And just, I just kind of was really involved with the now, whole you, process. When you say a you satire know, site, are you talking something like the Onion? In that kind of satire, uh, we, we made the Onion. We dwarfed the Onion. Um, we were we created a site that the Onion wished they could have been. <laughs> That's. That's how great we were. We we fooled more people than the onion could have ever have fooled. Oh, so oh, so you you pulled a SoCal. We were literally the largest. We we created. We are the god. We were the godfathers of fake news and trolling. We'll just leave it at that. Um, uh, yeah. Babylon B is a is a uh, is a remnants of what we started. Yeah, I um, I've always I've always loved that kind of 
that kind of thing, and partic and participated in my own little bit of fake news a long a long time ago that almost started a health scare. Um, oh shit! Are you? Um, I are you fam are you fam are you familiar with the so-called hoax? Um, if you describe it, probably. Um, there was a there. I believe he. I believe he was. I believe he was, I believe he was a um, physicist named Sokal who um, wanted to prove a point about how 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 some how some soft science publications had vi had little to no um, quality control and very little in the form of. P oh, is this where they just they submitted a bunch of the studies and then they got published through with no actual verified data and stuff? Yeah, he he, he put a bunch of studies that were complete bullshit and yeah. <laughs> managed to get them published. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I definitely heard about that one. That that just goes, and that's what we were doing. We went after the uh, political realm hmm. and played both sides and showed that um, everybody's an idiot. Is what kind of what our whole uh, goal was. Uh, you know, we didn't, we weren't targeting necessarily right or left or non-religious or religious. We we literally targeted everybody, and our whole proof was. Uh, People are so wrapped up in their political beliefs that they forget they leave intelligence at the door. So uh, the the stuff that we were writing about and the stuff that got picked up by national news and newspapers and radio hosts and magazines and we would just sit back and, and just laugh our asses off, going, "We cannot believe how dumb uh, these people these people are." And these are supposedly the smartest people in all their industries, and they can't figure out a troll when they see it. And we were very blunt about it too. I mean, the stuff we were writing about, the characters we recre recreated were so over the top that there's no way we thought there was no way people wouldn't pick it up. But I mean, that's what we get for assuming uh, people have a higher IQ than eighty, which we've learned is not not necessarily the case um, <laughs> in our in our country. Um. Now. In my in my case, the the stunt that I pulled was wasn't wasn't as grandiose. Um, the I got the whole idea after after my um after my science teacher when I was in high school, um had pl had played for us the original War of the Worlds broadcast. All right, yep, the original troll. Mm -hmm. And um, then and then I rem then I remembered a a bit of a, a then I remembered the fact that that week I had learned that the um chemical name for water is dihydrogen monoxide right and since since there were a few carbon monoxide scares going on around that time in my area i ended up getting an idea and i'm not the first one to do this but i um i put up a bunch of flyers all over all over the place warning about the dangers of dihydrogen monoxide about how to, about how too much about how too much of an ingestion of it could ki could kill you. How it can, how it contains all these how it has all these harmful additives. I technically did I technically didn't lie about anything that I said, right? Um, but I fr but I phrased it in a way that if you're not thinking, it could it could seem more dangerous than it is, right? And people ended up people bought it hook, line, and sinker. It got re it started to get more and more out of hand, and then I finally had to step in and go, guys. Calm your tits. It's just water, <laughs> right? No, I've I've seen that one before. Where people talk about it and they don't even know what the hell uh, the uh, scientific name for water is, and it is true. If you drink too much of it, it can kill you, just like anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I and like I like I said, it's uh, it it was what it was one of the it was one of those things. It was. I would. I should. I should have known. I should have known better that pe that people is if you put something spooky enough that they that they will believe that they will believe it because um well people well people fell for the free T-shirts um st stunt where I set I set up some lawn signs around a around a block that said free T-shirts turn right but if you followed the signs you'd just be driving in circles. You did that in your own town. Oops, yeah. yeah Reaver. Yeah, I, I I I found I I I hired I hired somebody to to make some custom lawn signs and the the whole reason I wanted to do it is because I wanted to make fun of all the of all the um 
small time politics lawn signs I was seeing everywhere. Because it was it was that time of, it was that time of the year when local officials are getting elected. Yeah, I got you. And everything's just caked with signs, mm -hmm. nonsense signs. Yeah. Yeah. So I, and so I want I wanted to I want I wanted to um, poke fun at the whole thing, um. But that that, but is I'm not gonna make fun of you for for your for your for your particular um entry. But I I do have to ask this because I actually actually no it's given given the origin that you mentioned I don't have to ask the the um, allegiance question because you because because your origin isn't on that particular spectrum but what I what I will what I will ask is walk me through the inspirations for the concept of Aerith and how and how it kind of came to be. So Aerith is actually a autobiography uh, from the point of view of someone who has experienced quite a bit of psycho psychedelic um, <laughs> projection. And um, I, I am high functioning Asperger. So uh, Aerith is my life story that I been writing about since i was a kid it, like i said it was a way for me to deal with trauma so let's say one day i was walking home and i got jumped by gang members i'd go home and write a story about how this superhero fought these evil villains and characters and just throughout the years i started developing more and more story uh, then i actually wrote a novel about it and it just wasn't you know what what i wanted it, it came out wrong Tried it again, worked with an editor. The editor just was overly editing. It wasn't the story I, I, I wanted to do. And then my buddy said, hey, you know, you should try it in comics because you're more of a visual guy. And started doing concept art with the guy and started writing out panels. And it just, it, it looked like what was in my head. These stories I would create in my head, uh, the people in my life, because every character in the book is actually a real person in my life. The, the, the names are actually the same the their their personalities are the same the dialogue is almost the same everything in the book is literally my life just turned into this weird projection of it obviously it's 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 my life is not that awesome we don't have hovering cool cars we don't have <laughs> we don't have robots and all this other crazy stuff and and awesome swords but it, it's just a crazy fictionalized version autobiography acid trip is the best way to really describe it. Um, and it's a way for me to deal with trauma that I've had in my life through a weird kind of artistic medium. And it allows me to also express my, my creativity part. Um, and then kind of, it does really help me with the Asperger's because it, it really actually lets me sit and uh, focus a couple hours out of the day to just work on this and get in that creative space. So yeah, it's just, it's really just a crazy ass autobiography. And that's, that's the inspiration is just to write all the crazy things that I've gone through in my life and all these crazy characters that I've, I've met in my life and show their stories as well. Mm -hmm. um, and with the now keep now keeping that keeping that kind of thing in mind um when you when you mentioned autobiography and that autobiography and that kind of crazy um what instantly came, what instantly came to mind is is something akin to fear and loathing in las vegas was <laughs> something like that an influence or is, or am i just reading something that isn't there no that's uh my influences are more of um you know, it's, it's, I don't really pull from, you know, from movies or anything. It's just, I, everything is kind of stuck in, in my mind is stuff from 84 to like 92. So anything that I was really doing and inspired by from those time periods. So 80s heavy metal, hair metal, um, suicidal tendencies, punk rock, ninjas, turtles, um, 
you know, any of the movies back back then or TV shows back then, the old cartoons like Brave Star and Silver Hawks and all the toys. And so I pull more inf inspiration from those uh, because those were the things that I w was involved with as a kid. You know, I, I, I listened to that music. I dressed that way. I hung out with those kind of people. I went to those shows, those music shows. Um so it's it, like I said, it's, all the influence is really pulled from me going back into my mind saying, you know, what was I into back then? Um, all right. I remember I used to wake up and watch Sunday morning cartoons. How do, how, how can we put that into the book? You know, it's, it's, that's where I draw all the creative inspiration. When we were doing costume design, I had my artists go and watch every single Motley Crue music video, every single Britney Fox music video. Mm -hmm. Um, and draw inspiration from there we're working on one of our side comics right now and the artist i said dude watch go and watch uh fashion shows from 87 draw inspiration from there so that's where it all comes from so people think i'm writing a nostalgia book trying to be nostalgic and it's not i try to explain there's a difference between trying to pretend and project that you came from that era and actually coming from that era um so that's 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 where the whole inspiration comes from when we're doing design and story arcing and characters and and vehicle design and architecture um and a lot of inspiration through never never ending story so and i will i will note on upon further upon further um upon further looking Something mm -hmm. else. Something else that I that ends up coming to mind in my head is <clears throat> the is um metal hurlant or as we knew it as we knew it here in the states heavy metal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of influence from heavy metal and hair metal. Yeah, a lot of it. Uh, not not when it comes not. I don't mean the genre. I don't mean the genre specifically. I'm, t I'm referring to the comic, or if you prefer, the um, that pair that pair of fi that pair of films that came out back in the day. Even though only the first one was actually good. Uh, which one are we talking about? Uh... The original Heavy Metal, not Heavy Metal 2000. Oh, we're talking about. I got. You. I thought you were talking about music. No, the actual books. So I get that a lot, and I was not exposed to those um uh, early on i so where i grew up um the closest comic shop or any kind of book medium mm -hmm. was a 30 minute bus ride and i didn't have access to that stuff so i didn't even find out about heavy metal the book until like 2012 um but now that i people have really kind of brought to it they're like hey Aerith has that like attitude from the girls you know in heavy metal i'm like i no clue um but yeah the 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 book itself i've been told that a lot that it seems there's a lot of influence from there but i've never been a reader of it i was even aware of it until uh yeah around 2012 when when uh a buddy had a copy and i was like what's this and i first thought it was what it was was like a heavy metal book of like because i remember i used to get music books for tablature and the covers sometimes looked like that there were cool crazy artwork on the front so I didn't even know what that was until I opened up and was like, "Oh, this is like some weird shit." <laughs> yeah, um, but tall her launch or heavy metal, it um was that was definitely in the crazy end of things, and it's also but it's also where a lot where a lot of um a lot of artists in Europe got their got one of their bit got one got some of their big breaks. Um, mm -hmm. One of the isn't it all like the, the new ones are I I don't follow I like really in all honesty I don't follow it I know isn't like the new ones just garbage like they're not even the same kind of um yeah 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 the new yeah there was that there was that little controversy when when one when one of their um when one of the um signature characters for for the thing um this, they decided to cover her up and then get and then act smug about the whole thing. Um, um, yeah, I know because I, I know their whole thing is very like in your face, you know. It's it's very punk rock and as far as uh, the image and the storyline, and then 
someone showed me the new stuff and was like, that's the same, that's the same book. Cause it doesn't feel like the same book. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, of course, as, of course, as as it goes, if uh, if if some if uh, inevitably someone's going to make an appearance to fill the particular niche when when one per- when one person or group isn't isn't scratching it. Mm-hmm. Um. But one of the, but one of the things that's that you've written out in the description is is um call, is calling it a cyber rock space opera. Um, yes. Now. What what uh, well rather, or if I need to go with the full thing, a cyber rock space opera lo- um love story, um, yeah. Obviously, obviously that's a lot of subgenres pa- packed in packed into one package. Um, right. But what but what I'm what I'm first curious about is what cyber rock means and how and how you define it. So everyone is on this whole cyberpunk genre jazz thing and. That's cool. I don't know. I don't see anything punk rock about it, if you ask me. So I don't even know why it's called cyberpunk. Um, so it's we a, didn't it's want a long we, story. It, it, it's a long we story. Didn't to, we didn't want to be labeled cyberpunk and people automatically assume they know the story or automatically um, say, oh, it's like so and so or it's like so and so. So we wanted to say, no, we're, we're cyber rock. We have a kind of a different attitude. We're not all electronics and bleeps and bloops and, you know, we wanted to throw people off so they couldn't label us. So mm-hmm. we created our own label. Um, so if anybody calls us cyberpunk, we say, no, that's absolutely incorrect. We're cyber rock and we're a little bit different. We, we are not all about, uh, you know, you know, we don't want to be compared to the video game. Uh, we definitely have a different attitude. I feel like our comic book has a, a really raw attitude to it. It has, that rocker attitude to it. So I thought cyber rock just kind of fit and it allowed us to label ourselves before anybody could label us and assume what the story was going to be about or how it was going to look or, or what, what it was going to do. Mm-hmm. And now when it comes, when it comes to where the punk rock, th- punk rock thing in cyberpunk comes from, um, that's, a, that's a, I've talked. I've talked about that with cyberpunk authors. It's a bit. It's a bit more complicated than it than it might appear. Um, mm. Especially, especially since, especially since um, something something like punk is fair is fairly open to interpretation. Not 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 a wide amount of interpretation, but there is there can be some debate, and of co- of course. Um, I'll I'll always remember I'll always remember the irony of a lot of of a lot of punk rock um review, uh, music reviewers not liking the album The Shape of Punk to Come because they had the audacity to use electronic instruments in it. Mm-hmm. Which ref- that particular album is an interest is an interesting listen, especially especially given how much of an influence it was on a lot of artists, but <laughs> it was not like that it was not well liked that at the time um but given but um given th- given that um and since since you, since it's um on the space opera end of things would you say space opera is a genre that ha- that has a very wide net and would you say that your particular brand of space opera is a little bit more pulpy than the people whose main introduction to space opera is star wars yeah, it's definitely more pulpy, and, and we actually pull um, because we do have music in our, you know, universe of of era. So tape one, mm-hmm. I don't know if you've seen it. The actual comic book comes in a cassette tape box, and that cassette tape box is an actual soundtrack on Spotify, Apple, iTunes, all that other fun stuff. Um, tape two comes in a different tape box, completely different album. So that's why we put the space opera in there uh we 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 were using it as as a more of a musical label mm-hmm. uh for people so it's it's yeah it's it's literally this crazy you know like we, we like to label it cyber rock as we go more into the story you'll see that each character actually has a musical background and we actually start putting music in the comic itself 
and the music that's in the comic you'll actually be able to touch and hold as these boxes you get for each tape and you can listen to that music on whatever platform you choose to listen to there it's on everything so that's where more the space opera label comes from because we want people to kind of hint that there is some kind of musical flair with this because we, we try to give people more than just a reading sense of the comic we want to give them a touch here we even have smell mm -hmm. with uh, our tape too so that's why we're, we're incorporating that that space opera part to it it's not necessarily you know star warsy saga stuff or whatever label it's literally we want people to think well why the hell is it a space opera is there, there music here um because a lot of people who hear that word i don't even think associate um a star wars or something else they 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 look at it as music and that's why we use that that word it was more of a marketing um truth be, uh, truth be told i was getting i was actually going to ask if um if the if your particular brand of space opera leans more towards um flash gordon or, uh, or some, yeah there you go or some yes other, or if we want if we want to go with, with an even deeper cut some of the some of the um or some of the early days of of um pulp of pulpy SF, of some of the pulpy sf from 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 say the 20s like or even yeah. even before that like say um john carter or the barsoom saga if you prefer well it's very flash um influence only because of the queen the queen element um so we do pull from that a lot as well you'll see that so with each comic book we have our 48 page main story and then there's a 12 page supplement that we always uh, do a backstory of certain characters so you kind of get a little bit more um content but we're able to break it up so you can get some backstory and our current one is very 70s flash gordon mm -hmm. style artwork as far as architecture and uh, outfits. And I just love that because of the Queen element. I'm a huge Queen fan. Um, and Freddie Mercury actually has a lot, a lot of influence in our main comic too. He's actually considered a god in our comic book. <laughs> yeah, and with, with the... Avid with that kind of thing with that kind of thing in mind um mm -hmm. the other the other as the other aspect that i'd be i'd be curious about on this is the is the fa is the fanta um the fantastical end of things because i note i noticed aside from a lot of color you have a, you have a lot of a lot of the landscape imagery um, mm -hmm. would feel would feel right at home on a um on a prog on a prog rock album <laughs> I never thought of it that way. <laughs> um, I I just did desert because I just grew up in the desert. But now that I think about it, I could I could see that for for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, some oh, some some of the some of the more some of the more space themed stuff that you that you that you might see uh, that you might have seen Frazetta do in some in some cases would certainly yeah. fit a lot. Of, in fact, a lot of pulp covers from back, from back in the day would. Um, if I need to use a more contemporary example of of that sort of progressive, um, say war the Warp Riders album from The Sword, if you're familiar with that band. No, I'm gonna have to Google that one. Um, the sword, the sword is a, is one is one of the is one of the bigger names when it comes to. Um, oh, when it comes to th when it comes to throwback styles of um, music, okay, they're techni they're technically referred to as doom metal, but um, they'd f they'd fit ri they'd fit right in oh, with an with any early rock group in the in the seventies. And... Yeah, no, I'm looking them up right now. They definitely have the look for it too. Mm -hmm. Um, but when, but. I like their logo. Their logo is really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, but when it comes, but the uh, the other thing that I feel I feel I need to ask is, um, if you'll forgive me for sounding a bit Jerry Seinfeld, what's the deal with the tacos? <laughs> um, so the taco plays a very important role in the story, and we can't give that away because that's the breaking point of the greatest battle that people will ever read 
in our comic book. <laughs> There's always that one little straw that breaks the camel's back, and that straw is um, fortunately a delicious taco. And Aerith is a fan of tacos. It's just, and it's just it's it's literally just a way for us to be silly and and add a humor aspect to a story that actually gets really really dark. Um, tape two, you do kind of get to see a little glimpse of the darkness, and we needed a way to keep the humor through the story so it's not just this doom and gloom, oh depressive melancholy freaking world um so we just thought a taco we could t we could if there's one thing out of this world that's you know there's so much destruction and pain and suffering what is the most ridiculous thing that would cause the the destruction of of this world and we were like a fucking taco um so that's what we came up with and we worked it in and it, it works out great um uh, people will see they'll get to see it as we go further along into into the story but it it plays a great part in in the book to keep keep that humor aspect, um, no matter how deep and dark we get with the with the comic. Mm -hmm. Now, with now taking taking that into taking that into account, into account um, would you would it be fair to, would it be fair to say that that um that you try that you're trying to Trying to strike, trying to strike a de a delicate balance between not being serious but not being complete um, farcical. Um. Well, no, we're using we use humor as a way to trick the reader into thinking they know the story and thinking that they're following the story. Um, the story itself is actually quite dark. The ending itself is very, very dark. Um, the characters themselves, we all learn that they are extremely dark. And the only way we could, in a way of keeping the reader guessing, is to, like you said, you know, balancing it out with that humor. Um, but that's not the, you know, the, the humor isn't the main factor in the in the story. Uh, but we also didn't want people reading going, Jesus Christ, I mean, fuck, I'm just reading this depressive comic book, you know, that people don't want to read that people want to have some kind of giggle, some kind of laugh. Um, but it is also a tool that we could drag the reader on a plot and kind of flip it on them through humor and through darkness. And the only way we were able to do that is to constantly have a buildup of humor within the within the whole comic and we've written the whole story out it's it's done completed and we had to go back because there was just parts that were just like we would read and go damn if i was a reader i'd probably stop at this point because it's just like this is this is a little bit too deep for me so we fixed that by adding um just off the wall humor i drew a lot from um my daughter was really into teen titans Mm -hmm. and night begins to shine episode um we drew a lot from that actually to to pull into humor i don't know if you've seen those two episodes before but that's kind of how we pulled into it <clears throat> but at the same time we had to figure out why that humor was instilled in such a dark story so we had to write a backstory of how that humor is in, you know installed into the story and there's a reasoning for that and um it makes it, it it makes it understandable of how you can have this weird humor that kind of doesn't even belong in the story, if you ask me, but it still works. Um, it's hard to describe without kind of going into the story, but um, as we go on deeper into the tapes, each tape, each season of, of, of Aerith, people will understand why the humor is there, and the humor itself actually plays a part into um the plot itself so it was really difficult but i think we did it i think we were able we're able to pull it off yeah um now keep now keeping that keeping that in mind uh when i look when i look at the when i look at the writing um mm -hmm. a there's a couple of things that, there's a couple of things that i could i can't help but notice one um the um gratuitous use of spa of spanish 
I'm yes. I'm not I'm not <laughs> enough of I'm not enough of a of a, of a um I don't know. I could. I call it a. They call it a spanophile. Um, I, right. I can't. I can't speak. I can't speak. I can barely speak English good enough. Let alone. Let alone Spanish. Um, I'm right there with you. So I can't. I, can, so I, I can barely speak English. So I can't. So I can't tell. So I um, am not the person to judge about whether or not this is um, whether or not this is prop, whether or not this is Spanish or Spanglish, as it as it's been called. Um. um. There is a little bit of Spanglish, but there's definitely um, hardcore, proper, deep, either Puerto Rican Spanish or Mexican Spanish. Uh, there is a there is a massive difference. Um, yeah, but I that think... is there because it is a big part of how I grew up. Um, the character Aerith is mm -hmm. that that split of of English and Spanish and. We needed this fiery Latina, and you can't have a fiery Latina without her yelling at you in Spanish or yeah. getting pissed off in Spanish. It just doesn't work. And if you try to translate it in English, it does not have the same no. effect. <laughs> no, it does. Yeah. That's, that's our, our video, you know, our pitch video, when people listen to it, they're like, I have no idea what she said, but it was fucking great. Um, um so <laughs> it's, kind, it's kind of it's kind of like some it's kind of like someone get someone just casual just it's kind of like the paradox of someone just casually conversing in in German and it sounds like they're pissed off. Right. You you probably you probably seen the me you probably seen the meme of of say a little a little puppy insult in English a lo a lion insult oh, insulting yeah. you in Spanish then yep. C then Cthulhu saying anything in German. <laughs> yeah. Um. You know my. Uh... My side of the family is from Lithuania, so when we would have our family members who were, you know, fluent in Lithuania, it sounded like they were just mad <laughs> the whole time. But they were just talking about the weather or what they did that day or how beautiful the, their dress was. But it just was it's it was just so rough. And it's the same thing with Spanish. If you're trying to showcase this Latin character you you just can't unless the language is involved too and it really works out because me growing up in every school i went to was like 98 99 percent hispanic i didn't know half the shit people were saying so i wanted again this is an autobiography i want the reader to feel the same way i feel felt mm -hmm. during these times so if you don't know spanish and eric's just babbling along you're getting the, you're getting the same feeling as i did so that's why we really, you know, like the Spanish part in the comic book. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, you can just tell people, we tell people to translate. We've been asked, are you going to put, you know, English blurbs at the bottom? And we've, you know, we've stuck to our guns. No, we want it to be um, a confusion feeling. And you go and look it up and you're going to get a weird ass translation because the way it translates in English isn't, it has does not have the same effect. And after you've read a couple of Earth books, you'll know how to insult people in the most derogatory ways possible in Spanish. Although, um, because because of, because of the fact that we're do that we're doing the ang that we're doing that we're playing on the whole angry Latina thing, um, I I have to I have to ask the terrible question. Yes. Are you afraid of slippers? Uh, chunkless? Yes. <laughs> I I realize it is that's a legit, the, I realize, it is a legit thing. Oh, I know it's a legit thing. I've seen I've seen that thing get tossed. That thing never misses. I was on a live stream with the the guys from Six Five Six um, Comics, and half the guys are in Mexico, and the other half the guys are in El Paso. And live on air, this guy was giving his wife lip, and you just saw a fucking chunkla just fly from the frame and hit him in his head, and we're like. People think it's a stereotype. It is a legit thing. You will get a sandal thrown at your head. The thing about stereotypes is, what, if you dig deep enough, you will find some origin story that's that's that has some degree of truth to it. Right. Um. Every 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 idiom or or the like has as some kind of as some kind of story. Um. Stereotypes don't just appear out of thin air. No. Um. Like, yeah, and, and I've had that people – when I first launched our first tape, I actually got a lot of kickback because people were saying I was stereotyping. I was a white male writing a, a story about a Latina. What do oh. I know? And I'm sitting here going, 
Oh, I'm no. looking at their avatars and they look whiter than I am. And I'm sitting here going, well, this is the world I grew up in. So actually, dude, like, who are you to tell me what I am and, and you know, and aren't? So um, whenever, whenever, whenever that can, whenever that kind of thing comes up, um, the, the story, the story that, I, that I all, that always ends up coming to mind is, um, the fa is, um, stuff is, for one, well, there's several stories that come to mind. One is um, the book series Tales of the Otori, which is a very samurai tragedy seri series of novels. Okay. Um, and the writer who went under the um, pen name Leanne Hearn, um, she spent several years in as part of a writer's exchange program in um, Kyoto and or, and the Japanese countryside in various er various areas. And that's what she drew upon, and she was she was there for like seven years, okay. and she drew upon she drew upon that experience. Um, and in in the case of, um, and of course, when it comes to music, there there is a there is a band in Argentina called Skiltron. All right. That instead of do instead of doing the kind of music you would expect from from the from the local area they do celtic folk metal oh wow okay that's not what i would expect <laughs> our artist is from is from there so i'll have to ask him about that um and there's there's a there is a there is a um um melodic death metal band called whispered in uh in finland of course it's from okay. finland that it does samurai metal <laughs> Like the first album that they did was one giant tribute to the to, um, bet to the story of Ben K, the ma the ma the man who was the man who was so ugly people people wouldn't look at his fit would look wouldn't look at his face, um when tr when he would challenge them to duels, which is why right. he kept winning and taking their swords. He was obsessed with collecting a thousand swords from a thousand duels. All right. Um. And. The, the point, and there's there's been there's been plenty of there's been plenty of those, um kind kind of set kind of kind of setups, um, like especially especially these days the whole the whole idea the whole idea that you have to be of a, of a certain ethnicity in order in order to write a certain story, um, if you that can that kind of thinking deserves a br deserves a bridge to be sold, <laughs> right. Like they, sh they're probably buying the Brooklyn Bridge because it's essentially a belief that there's so that there's some sort of magic X factor where where writing it me where where um where your ethnicity determines what you're able to write. Right. I, yeah. I don't I don't care for it, and the fact of the matter is, um, especially especially with how interconnected people have people have been for decades now, cross pollination is going to happen. Yep. Um. And the other thing that I was curious when it came when it came to the writing is what is um you ha is one of your other characters really likes using holy Kurt holy Kurt Russell. <laughs> yep. How did how did was that just, was that just something that you that you mentioned you mentioned off you mentioned offhand and it just, mm. and it just stuck. So um. In the book, in the in the book, or I should say, in the in the universe, they believe the movie stars and musicians from Earth are actual like gods. So there's this 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 mechanic piece called the glitch, and the glitch grabs data from parallel worlds, and one of those worlds is Earth. It's able to pull in. Uh, movies and music and the, the guy who controls that the creator uses it as propaganda and one of those things is he has the citizens believe that kurt russell is actually all those characters he plays they're real life move they're, they're not movies they're they're recorded real things um so there's this place called the the hall of champion badasses which is just thousands of statues of all the cool awesome uh movie stars and musicians from like 82 to 94 um what we go and actually list them we're going to list every single one and just rafa's 
the, like his his god that he loves the most is Freddie Mercury and Kurt Russell. So we just we just had to figure a way of how do we play in the fact that they believe these are gods. Well, instead of saying oh my god or Jesus Christ, they're gonna say Holy Kurt Russell or you know Saint Freddie Mercury or Holy Axl Rose, and it just kind of stuck in. Uh, one of our voiceovers actually <laughs> runs the hashtag Holy Kurt Russell all the time. Um, we want to make shirts, but I, I just don't know the legalities of that, actually. I mean, Kurt Russell could be anybody. Kurt Russell could be the name of my cousin for all uh, for all he knows. But, yeah, we have we have statues of Kurt Russell. There's a part. Um, remember in, in um, Never Any Story where Atreyu has to run through the first um, – God, now I can't even think of their names – and the laser beams come through. Yeah. You have to have. So we have the same thing in our book, but on one side is Freddie Mercury and the other side is Kurt Russell's statue. Mm. And you have to prove your badassness. So we draw from just that kind of craziness. And Kurt Russell, I mean, I love all those movies. Who, who doesn't? So we wanted to put that <laughs> put that in there. And so we made them all gods. It's, I, can, I, can cert, I can certainly see that because, well, um, Clark's law is a thing. Mm-hmm. Plus, um, plus you're you're in good company since the whole idea of people looking at at te- at television or film and think and thinking that is real. Um, Galaxy Quest did something not too far off, if you recall that film. The not the not the one that they did with the uh, Tim Allen. Yep, that one. God, mm-hmm. it's been a long time since I saw that movie. Um, and yeah, it's what it's it's just one it's just one of those things that immediately came to mind because because of what you had because of what you had mentioned through the um, using the the movies and stuff like that. Believe in the real. Yeah. Now, one of the uh, one of the other things that's that's mentioned on the Indiegogo page is a mini series that's also being developed called "The Adventures of Todd Boy and Mox." Yep. Um, what can what can you tell me about that particular thing? Is it is it basically a case of taking place around the same time as the Aerith story? Yeah. So what we what we're doing with each tape, so you have your forty eight page you know main IP, mm-hmm. and what we're doing with each tape is we're doing a twelve page mini series, and every mini series will take a look into each of the main characters like beginnings. And Todd Boy and Mox are two guys that get introduced in tape three. They're just insane characters. So we wanted to, to show people the beginnings of those two's relationship, where they came from. Um, they are in the comic book. You see them as these Imperial officers. Todd Boy is this number one general. Mox is this number one scientist. Then we go into when we go into tape three, you're going to see these are guys are completely different but you you get to see the the journey of where they came from to where they are now, why they are the way they are. Because we didn't want to just go, oh, this guy's pissed off because so and so. Yeah, that's great. You you know, it covers the basis of of connecting the dots. But we wanted to show it. So we took um, our buddy Esquivo. He agreed to do the penciling. Our buddy Tiago wanted to do the inking, and then Steve Cannon's doing the coloring. And we wanted to, to have a different look and a different feel. So. Mm-hmm. That's what we drew from the 70s look. There's a lot of 70s architecture, 70s coloring, uh, 70s character style, costume design, stuff like that. So it's really just us allowing us to build backstory in a very small amount of content. 12 pages isn't that that much to read. Mm-hmm. But now you're kind of equipped with the backstory instead of going, okay, here's two characters you just introduced. We know they were they used to be Imperial, you know, um, officers cool well let's go into that story uh our next tape we're going to be going in a backstory about the virginity gang which is this crazy gang that earth battles and we talk about the beginning of that it's a 12-page battle se- uh, series that we'll be doing with tape three so it's just a cool way for us to give the reader more uh, and to kind of experience different artwork from the different guys in our wheelhouse as well Now, you're you're writing both of them, um, which leads me to ask the question of how do you make sure that 
the writing style of of Aerith doesn't blend doesn't blend into the mini stories. Um. So the mini stories are actually were originally a part of the main story. So uh, the actual story of Aerith, if I was if I was to write out a novel of it, we're talking maybe. Um, let's just say I have 600 pages of just one line notes in Google Docs. So to turn that into a story is massive. I mean, just it, we're, we're, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of pages and multiple books to write it out. So the book itself, the story itself has been written. I've just taken portions of the book and instead of adding it to the main IP of Aerith Contillion War, mm -hmm. I've just pulling those pieces out and putting them into their own little like IPs. So the, the writing has already been done. We're just, uh, you know, taking them out of the story saying, okay, we're not going to tell it in this IP. We're going to tell it in this IP. So the writing is the exact same flow. It's the exact same humor, um, stuff like that. And that's how we were able to kind of not have to worry about, oh crap, am I writing a whole new story? No, it's literally the story just, we just ripped a little bit of a piece off of it and it said, nope, now it's its own standalone miniseries. Now, t now, um, with that kind, with that kind of thing in my, with that kind of thing in mind, um, as I, as I under as I understand it, you're go you're shooting for about um, I believe I believe forty eight forty eight pages, um, mm -hmm. and that's forty eight pages total. How how many pages are you dedicating to Arith, and how many pages are you dedicating to the mini story? So it's forty eight pages of, of pure content mm -hmm. for Arith. And that's its own standalone book. And then uh, Adventures of Todd Boy and, and Mox, 12 pages of content, standalone book. You get both with tape two. So you're getting 60 pages of, of readable content. All right. I can, all right. I can, I can get, I can get behind that. It was, I was main, I was mainly curious if it, if the, if it was a all in one kind of thing and then how, and then what the uh, balance would be. Oh, no, yeah, they're their own two pieces, like their own separate comic books. Um. Now, with with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, I know you'd I know you'd put how far how far along the thing is, but what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Um, I know that the book is currently on the in demand end of things. So we are actually, I need to update that we are probably around 64% done. Mm -hmm. um, we're knocking out almost a page a day now. Um, the Ventures of Todd Boy and Mox, that'll probably be done mid-September. So that'll be done. Uh, Aerith itself will probably be done end of September, if not the first or second week of October. It'll go out to print, and we should have that back at the latest, the end of October, and start fulfilling around Halloween. As long as COVID doesn't <laughs> screw anything up, we'll be good. Um, in in lieu of that, and and to make sure we don't tempt the gods of irony, right? Just say, just saying. You know how you know how Lady Luck can be. Oh, I do. Um, and to and with. With that kind, with that kind of thing in mind, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how this particular adventure de adventure develops. Um, especially especially since um, comic books comic books um, for a lot of for a lot of people are way too serious. We need a little bit more crazy, a little bit yeah, more batshit. <laughs> yeah, which this is. <laughs> we we've, we've had um, a couple of the artists that we work with. You know, we give them the kind of the whole plot. Mm -hmm. So they, it just helps artists to develop when they're doing certain scenes because they know something's going to happen. So they, they, they draw the scenes a certain way. And one artist just went, what the fuck are you writing? <laughs> um, another guy went, that is the craziest shit I've ever heard in my life. And then our main artist, NC, who works on our main IP, he just, he's excited because he's, like, dude, I've never seen a story that goes in that direction before. And he's worked on a lot of comic books. And um, he's he's full-time with us now because he 
loves the story so much. So to get a, a, a an artist to say, I don't want to do any more work because I only want to work on this because I love the story so much, kind of gives validation uh, with what we're doing is is pretty damn cool. Yeah. And as a bit as a bit of a as a bit of a capstone when it comes when it comes to that when it comes to that. Um you meant you mentioned a you mentioned a kind of pro, you mentioned a kind of product thing. So it, so I'm ge I'm guessing I'm guessing that you ha that you have you have a bit of a universe planned when it comes to this set this particular world. Yeah, we have a massive universe and we're going to be putting the map and all the lore on our website and the map will be interactive so you can go across the world of of Indio and see all the different markers so if you see a, something in the comic you'll be like oh okay that's where that is that's pretty cool and click on it and it'll describe what that you know waypoint or key point is because uh, we want people to really explore this universe which is also why we have a game in development too and that game lets you explore the world and take part in one of the ma major events that happened in that world. Um, we want a full, just immersive experience with, with, with this comic. And that's why, again, I'm not coming at this as a comic writer. I'm coming at this as a product developer and, a, and someone who does branding. That's my background. That's what I do for a living. Um, so with our comic, you're not just getting a readable book. You're going to get a world. You're going to get, um, you're literally going to be able to experience everything that we're talking about, either through music, through video games, through video, which we will be doing like two minute animated shorts uh, just to speed up process of content. So instead of relying on comic books and I mean, they take a lot, long time to make, we could be knocking out two two minute animations while we're working on comic books. So there's just constant content coming out to our reader who's not just a reader, they're literally a customer at this point, mm -hmm. um, and offering as much content, swag, product, um, stuff like that. And that, that's where we're coming at. Uh, our plan at the end of 2022 is to be completely off crowdfunding and going 100% through our website, everything. And with the... And I'll certainly be looking for forward to seeing how that seeing how that develops, especially given the conversion stuff that that I that I've done in the past with cert, with certain material. Uh -huh. um, but with that with that said, I'd like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the particular bits of insanity that happen around here. No worries, man. Thanks for having me. I know we booked this out a while ago, so. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the patience for waiting on me. I I have I seem to have the patience of a saint, according to some people, which is absolutely hilarious to me. Well, if people haven't read stories about saints. I don't know why they say patience because I've read some stories about saints that are pretty brutal. <laughs> um, if I were if I were to, first off, I'm a monk, not a saint, and second off. If I were if I were to become a saint, I'd rather I'd rather be the saintly version of that priest from Dead Alive. Right. You know, though I kick ass for the Lord. Yeah. That's the that's the worst accent you'll probably hear today. But I'll try to beat it by some. I'll, I'll ask some. I'll ask my three year old to do accents for me. <laughs> um, I guess that'll that'll count as a palate cleanser, I suppose. <laughs> but anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to go go further into the go further into the world of Aerith or or just to just to do a glorified shit post, the door right. is always open. Awesome, At man. Well, now we're we're connected on Discord, so yeah, I, I'll drop some stuff mm -hmm. to you if anything that's interesting to you. We'll pop back on and do a show. Yep. Um, as I often say here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I'll and, agree to that. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>